Hello and welcome to this week's vlog. I'm taking some inspiration this week from a couple of comments that I've had on Twitter about uh, basically who are my favourite historical figures. Now if you don't know much about me you'll know, um, then you should know this basically. I love history. I grew up loving history. Um, my mum was an avid reader of historical books. We always had historical documentaries on the TV. Our holidays were always visiting castles and going and doing these uh, wonderful things, going to museums and all sorts of stuff. And it really got me hooked. Um, like many children growing up in the 90s, uh, something that was really big in my house was Time Team. So that got me into the archaeology side of things. But I think I was more interested in interpreting the finds and looking at sources and things like that. So I went down the history route rather than the archaeology route. And when I grew up I had a fantastic history teacher for GCSE. Um, he was absolutely incredible. He was so enthusiastic and he went out of his way all the time to encourage us. He even took one Saturday out of his weekend to take a gr small group of us up to London to visit all sorts of museums and things like that just for our GCSEs. He was an incredible influence on my education and he really believed in me. He was one of the teachers at secondary school that really saw something in me and that also instilled a lifelong love of history. So I'm still really interested in history. I went to university, I studied history uh, for my degree, for my undergraduate degree. Um, my particular favourite period of history is early medieval, so we're talking Anglo-Saxon, Viking, all the way up to up to the Tudors. I mean the Tudors are fine and a lot of people say that the Tudors are their favourite period of history because lots of amazingly bloody things happened. Uh, but personally, I don't know, there's something about the Tudors that don't sit right with me. They're just not my favourite in terms of historical figures, in terms of the things that they did. I feel like the Tudors have kind of been overdone, that it's kind of a given that the Tudors are a thing. To me, it's too late in history, there's a lot of records, we can trace a hell of a lot of stuff back. What I'm interested in is medieval stuff where sources are not quite so concrete. A lot of the time when people were writing about uh, things that were happening in medieval times there was a lot of embellishment, you have to read between the lines to see where the truth lies. Quite often an abbey would write the history of the local lord or monarch and they had a kind of a, an agenda, something that they were trying to push forward. One of the people that I'm going to be mentioning is Alfred the Great and he had his life written by the Welsh monk Asa. And you can get hold of this, this uh, body of work and it's great and clearly Asa loved Alfred the Great and I believe that he was telling as much truth as he could but at the same time he is kind of blowing smoke up his ass. So you've got to kind of look out for these things in historical sources. That's the technical term of course by the way, blowing smoke up his ass. So with no further ado, let me crack on with some of my favourite historical figures. The first one I'm going to tell you about is uh, Richard III. I love Richard III. He, I feel, was a much maligned king. Uh, a lot of this is to do with the fact that um, history is often written by the victors. So in his case the Tudors presented an image of him as this callous, nasty, murderous, horrible human being, so bent over by the weight of his evil and that's where the hump in his back came from. When in actuality he suffered from a disability that we today have the medical knowledge to sort out, scoliosis and he was a very reluctant king. He was never meant to be king. His older brother was Edward IV and Richard spent his entire life uh, basically with the War of the Roses raging on. The War of the Roses ended with the Battle of Bosworth which Richard was defeated by the Tudor forces. Henry Tudor was not even there. At least Richard was on the battlefield, which is why I prefer him as well to the Tudors. He did right by his family. He loved and supported his older brother, despite not necessarily agreeing with his older brother's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville. He loved and supported his 
brother's children, the princes in the tower. And I don't personally believe that he had those boys murdered. It just doesn't seem to me that that's the sort of thing that Richard would have done. It doesn't seem to feel right to me. That's my personal belief. I mean, the thing is, we will never know what happened to the princes in the tower, but I just don't think that it fits with the way Richard was for the rest of his life. He was very devoted to York, very devoted to being the Duke of York, and he really was very devoted to the North, and York, particularly at the time, was very, very supportive of Richard. They, they loved him. The people loved him in York. And I don't, I just don't believe that he would be capable of killing the nephews that he so, so loved. So as I say, we'll never find out what happened to the princes and the result of their disappearance or death or whatever happened to them is that Richard did become king. He did become Richard III. Um, and I personally was so happy when his body was found. And it felt like closure. I I never thought growing up that I would ever live to see the day that Richard's body was discovered and that he was given the burial that he deserves. There's some arguments about where he's buried and where he should have been buried. But for now, I am just so relieved that he has been found and we can start to look at him through a fairer set of eyes. Now, sticking with the same family, I want to talk about George Plantagenet. He was the first Duke of Clarence. He was the middle brother between Edward and Richard. Uh, one of the brothers between Edward and Richard. And he was an interesting character because he was actually convicted of treason. When Edward was king, Edward IV, and the Wars of the Roses were taking place, George Plantagenet, first Duke of Clarence, initially sided with York, sided with his brother, and fought alongside Edward and Richard and their father and all sorts of... The, well, I mean, their father prior to Edward becoming king. And then he switched sides, and he went and supported the Lancastrians, and he tried to switch back again, but he ended up being convicted of treason. Shakespeare retells it and suggests uh, in Richard III, at the beginning of Richard III, that Richard actually had him framed for treason because of the support that he had given to Lancaster, which ultimately were the winners with the Tudors. Uh, but the way it actually happened, he was convicted for treason, and what do you do when you are king and your brother is convicted of treason against you? You put them in the Tower of London. This is what the Tower of London is partly for. It's a defensive place, yes, but it's also a very sort of high-class prison. So he was put in the Tower of London and convicted, tried and convicted, and was to be privately executed on the 18th of February, 1478. That's all we really have as a record, but the myth that has been passed down is far more fun. The myth is he got to choose the method of his execution and that he was drowned in a vat of his favourite Malmsey wine. I don't know if that's true or if he was beheaded or hung or what but it does make a nice story to suggest that he was drowned in his favourite wine. Moving on we move to one of the Edwards. This time I'm going to talk about Edward II he was another king who was never supposed to be king. So like Richard never intended to become king, Henry VIII, just a little aside, was never intended to become king. He was intended for the church. His older brother Alfred was supposed to become king, but his brother died before he could inherit the throne. And so Henry, being the spare, became the heir. Edward was in a similar situation. His older brother Alfonso died before he inherited the throne and so Edward became king. During his reign he led campaigns against Scotland and he was forced to relinquish the crown after a rebellion um, from his own his own son uh, who became Edward 
third. Well, I say his own son. People who claimed to be working on behalf of his son. It was a rebellion, basically, and because Edward the third was 14 when he became king, a lot of these men felt that they could control him. He was still considered a minor, and they felt they could control him better than his father. So it was better to have him in place than to have Edward the second in place. He wasn't executed. He was supposed to be cared for at Berkeley Castle in Gloucester. However, he died under suspicious circumstances. It may be that he was depressed from his imprisonment. There are records to suggest that he was suffering from depression. And there was a cult surrounding his death. His funeral cost £351, which at the time was an incredibly large sum of money. Bearing in mind, this was the this was the 14th century. So that's a hell of a lot of money. There were gilt lions. There were oak barriers to hold back the anticipated crowds. There was a funeral effigy. That was the first time an effigy had been used in this way. His tomb became a tourist site. Visitors travelled from all over and the monks were quite happy because they were not on the usual pilgrimage route. Miracles were claimed to have happened at his tomb and in 1395 there was an appeal to have him canonised. Sainted. The interesting thing about Edward is there's a myth around his death as well. As with all these things in the Middle Ages, word of mouth gets passed down and it ends up becoming lore. It ends up in the, in the collective consciousness. It's said that if he was murdered, because his death was so suspicious, it may have been that he received a red-hot poker up the bottom. However, this myth has also been attributed to several other people throughout history, so who knows? The fact is, he did die under suspicious circumstances, and we will never know the truth of that. On to someone completely different, not a king this time. I'm going to talk about Elmer of Malmesbury. Elmer was a monk at Malmesbury, obviously, hence Elmer of Malmesbury, and he wrote a lot of books on astrology. That was his big topic of ex expertise, was astrology. But we're not going to talk about astrology, because that's not the fun bit. We're not quite sure how old Elmer was when he died, but we know he was described as being an old man in 1066 when William the Conqueror was basically trying to review all of these lands that he was taking and all of these abbeys and things, and who was there. We know he's described as being an old man in 1066. What's interesting about Elmer is that he believed he could fly. In his youth, he attempted to fly. He had read the Greek fable about Daedalus, Daedalus and Icarus, who had were trying to escape and attached wings to themselves and tried to fly and Icarus flies too close to the sun and the wax melts or the feathers fall off and he falls to his horrible death. He believed that if he attached wings to his arms and his feet he might be able to fly. So he created these wings and then he jumped from the abbey tower. Now because he's an old man in 1066 there's the spoiler alert he did survive it was recorded that he had a few broken bones, broken legs, that sort of thing. But apparently he did actually glide. There was no control though because the thing he lacked was a tail. That's what people now believe. But yes, Elmer of Malmesbury believed he could fly. On to another religious man, Thomas a Becket. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury and at the time of Henry II's reign. Uh, what happened was Henry II was seeking less clerical independence and he wanted a weaker connection with Rome. So this predates anything that Henry VIII was trying to do. There was this kind of tension with Rome even back then. Becket refused to sign the accords basically saying that Henry would have more power and Rome would have less. He agreed in principle with what Henry was saying but he didn't sign his name. As a result, he was convicted of contempt of royal authority. For a couple of years, he escaped and lived in France. He was given protection by King Louis VII of France. And he threatened excommunication on Henry II. However, Pope Alexander III favoured a more diplomatic approach. And there were talks with Henry, which meant that a compromise was reached, allowing Thomas Becket to return to England, which he did in 1170. However, 
In June 1170, Roger de Pont l'Evêque, Archbishop of York, Gilbert Folliot, Bishop of London, and Jocelyn de Bohon, Bishop of Salisbury, crowned the heir apparent Henry the Young King at York. Now this goes against everything that was supposed to happen. It was a total breach of Canterbury's privilege of coronation, and Becket excommunicated all three in the November of 1170. It was about this time that Henry II uttered the words that his men believed meant... So, he uttered some words, basically, and his men believed that that meant he wanted Becket dead. Now, it's passed down through myth and legend that he said, will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? There's been some other suggestions of the things he might have said. Either way, there was a total misunderstanding, and his men, Reginald Fit Fitzurse, Hugh de Morville, and William de Tracy and Richard the Breton travelled to Canterbury on the 29th of December 1170. They hid their weapons outside, they went inside and told Becket that he had to go to Winchester to answer for his crimes uh, and to answer to Henry. Becket refused and when he did they went back outside, retrieved their weapons and went in and killed him while he was at Vespers. Very holy time of day for prayer and reflection terrible thing to do. He even confronted them about it, saying why would you do this to a religious man at Vespers, but they believed they were doing the right thing. Henry II, for the rest of his days, totally regretted the actions that had taken place. He basically banished all these men, and he himself punished himself forevermore. A cult was built up after Becket's death, and he eventually became canonised. So, I quite like that story. Uh, it's about time we mentioned a woman. One of the most kick-ass women of medieval ages, as far as I was con I'm concerned, is actually Eleanor of Aquitaine. She was the Queen Consort of France between 1137 and 1152. She eventually got an annulment, which is almost unheard of, but it was agreed because her, with her first marriage there were no sons produced to be an heir. She then married the King of England and became Queen Consort of England in 1154 to 1189. Then she had some sons, so I think we all know who was to blame for the first marriage. In her own right, she was Duchess of Aquitaine between 1137 and 1204. This woman lived a long time. She was nearly a hundred when she finally passed away, which is pretty much unheard of in medieval times. She led several armies, including the Second Crusade, led the armies, was at the forefront of the armies. She wasn't sitting behind, all dressed up in a nice pretty dress. She was out there actually kicking ass. Three of her sons went on to become king. Henry the Young King, who I mentioned earlier, Richard I, Richard Lionheart, who went on to lead a crusade of his own, and John, as in King John from Robin Hood. Her husband, Henry II, had her imprisoned for supporting their son Henry's revolt. And she was regent while Richard Lionheart was on that third crusade. She was running the country. The woman really did kick ass. And finally, I would never get away with this one. I am local to Winchester. I love Winchester. It's my favourite place. I got engaged there. I've spent most of my life there. I've worked there. I've been to university there been to school and college there, so I have to mention Alfred the Great. He's a local historical legend. He was the youngest son of Athelwolf of Wessex. Three brothers reigned before him, Athelbold, Ethelbert, and Athelred, because it wasn't a line of succession through the sons. There was a, a Witten, not Witten, that's not quite right. Yes, no, I am right. Who basically described, um, basically described, decided I can't talk. It's locked down, I can't talk. They decided who would reign, and it didn't necessarily follow that it would be your son, it could be your brother, it could be a cousin. It's whoever was best placed to be a warrior, because the important thing was that you had to be a warrior, you had to be able to fight in battle, and if the son was too young, you're not going to pick the son. He spent years, years, decades even, fighting the Vikings. The Battle of Eddington in 878, he was successful. 
in fighting the Vikings and created the Dane law, which effectively split the country in half and gave North of England to the Vikings. Uh, Watling Street is widely regarded as being the cut-off line for where the North of England starts. I know, I know, people in the South and North of England will always, always argue the toss on this one, but trust me, this is what it was under Dane law. Anything north of Watling Street was Danish, and that was the North of England. Don't argue with me, this is just what happened. He oversaw the conversion of the Viking leader Guthrum to Christianity. It was one of the conditions of the Viking losses uh, that he had to convert to Christianity. And he was personally the godfather to Guthrum. He had a reputation as a merciful and learned man, and he encouraged primary education to be in Anglo-Saxon rather than Latin to improve the quality of people's lives so that more people had access to education, more people had access to the scriptures. And if people didn't go on to learn Latin, at least they weren't totally disadvantaged because they could understand these things in Anglo-Saxon. He thought it was very important that everyone had a certain level of literacy. The legend... Well, and also, of course, that meant that he was able to... I'll come on to the legend in a moment. He was able to totally reform the legal system because he could put it into a way that ordinary people could understand because they it was written in the language that they spoke. And if they could read it, they were not disadvantaged. Legend has it that he was in the Somerset levels uh, fighting the Vikings and he was given shelter by a peasant woman who left him to watch some wheat and cakes. Preoccupied with the kingdom's problems, he let the cakes burn and was scolded by the woman. However, he basically retorted that the kingdom's problems were where his thoughts should lie and that some wheat and cakes were not as important as what he was trying to deal with. And that's why he became known as the Great. For everything he achieved, all the level of education, the victories against the Vikings, he really stands out amongst the early medieval kings as someone who achieved an awful lot. And as I said earlier, we know a lot of this because his life was so well documented by Asa and by others. And a lot of the documents, although written independently, seem to back up each other's stories. So we can pretty definitively say that we know the vast majority of truths about the life of Alfred the Great. Those are my favourite historical figures. I hope you enjoyed this particular vlog and I will see you soon. Bye bye.